بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته everyone I hope you're all doing well I'm Amal speaking your host and welcome to the last session of the Fundamentals of Islam series or course that we've been doing over the last 12 weeks um, it's a bit of a it's it's a bit of a sad day because it's the last session uh, last uh, um, session of the whole course. But inshallah, we're going to have lots of exciting new courses that we're going to explain to you at the end of the session. But for today, um, the sister who's going to be presenting for us is going to be Dr. Batul. She has been doing a, a few more of the sessions that uh, we conducted previously. And she, her topic, as you can see on the screen, is the Quran, the last testament. So, um, inshallah, without further ado, Dr. Batu will take it away. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. I'm actually really excited to be here and be talking about Quran, the last testament, because inshallah, it will bring together everything we've learned over the last few weeks. Um, so let's just have an overview of what we'll be talking about. As you can see, there's a lot of things on the screen. But basically what we'll do is for the first bit of the session, we'll just get a feel for what the Quran is. And then we'll start getting into a little bit of the technical aspect. But like all the sessions we've done before, the importance is not to memorize every single little thing. It's to give you a bit of a flavor, a bit of an introduction to everything, inshallah. So let's begin. I want to start with a little bit of a story because when I was asked to do this session, I had a flashback to a very particular moment in my life that happened a few months ago. Uh, a few months ago, I was at work, I was sat in the office and I was reading a little pocket translation of the Quran. So as most of you know, the Qur'an is written in Arabic, but I was reading a little English translation of the Qur'an when one of my colleagues walked in and she asked me what I was reading. And I told her, I told her I'm reading a translation of the Qur'an. And her next question was, what is the Qur'an like? Is it just stories? And the reason why I remember this incident is because I completely froze. I, my explanation, honestly, was so, uh, it was not very good. And that's why I'm not even going to share how I attempted to explain this. And the reason why I struggled is, A, I never really thought about how to answer that question. And B, it's because the Quran is unique. It's like, it's unlike any other book you've read before. And that's why when I attempted to answer this question and attempted to compare it to something she might know from before, I couldn't think of anything. And that's the beauty of Quran. It's completely unique. And so as we start this session and as we learn about Quran, I want you to forget everything you think you know about a book. And that's going to be the easiest way to understand what we're going to be talking about, because the Quran is utterly unique. And more than that, the Qur'an is a miracle. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us that every prophet essentially was given a miracle because it makes your belief in Allah stronger. It helps firm that belief. But the miracle the Prophet, peace be upon him, was given is the divine inspiration. Now, the divine inspiration is the Qur'an. So to put simply, the Qur'an was revealed to angel Gabriel, who then revealed it to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But we will go into a bit more detail about that later. So when we say that every prophet had a miracle, what do we mean? So, for example, the Prophet Moses, he had the miracle that the sea split in two for him. When we speak about Mary, mother of Jesus, peace be upon all of the righteous people of the past, her miracle was that Prophet Jesus spoke as a baby. For Prophet Abraham, it was the fire that went cold. All of these nations, all of these people had miracles. And the reason why is each prophet had a miracle that their particular nation, their particular group of people saw, and it helped them be more firm in their belief of Allah. 
Now, we've spoken about this before. Who are the people of the Prophet Muhammad? Who's the nation of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? That's us, right? So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, needed a miracle that could be seen for generations. You know, it couldn't just be the sea splitting in two because you had to be there, right? It had to be something that everyone could see. And that's why we have the Quran today. And if we reflect on the miracles that I just mentioned, if we let's, let's have a look at them. Fire is something we see in our day to day lives all the time. And yet it went cold for Prophet Abraham. And we can't replicate that. We see water all the time, everywhere. But we can't split the sea in two. We can't replicate that. These are everyday things that Allah elevates to the point of a miracle. And when we look at the Quran, if you just take a cursory look at it, what is it? It's words and letters. We use these things all the time. But we can't create anything like the Quran. And we know that because in the Quran itself, within the first, you know, the first um, few chapters, I believe the second chapter, Allah actually puts out a sort of challenge to people. Allah says, you know, if you're in doubt, bring a single chapter, like bring something, a single chapter, and that is the miracle of the Quran that all of these years have passed and no one has been able to recreate it. Inshallah, we will move on from there. So the miracle is A, its uniqueness, okay? But the miracle is also its content. So what happens when you open up this book? What happens when you see what is inside this book, and there is so much, you could do a whole separate talk about the miracles within the Quran. But inshallah, today we'll focus on historical, literary, and scientific miracles. We will just have a quick look at them and then move on. Uh, I will probably be using the word miracle a lot for the next 15 minutes or so, but bear with me. It can't be helped. The Quran, the whole of the Quran is a miracle on so many levels. Let's have a look at historical miracles. What's a historical miracle? In the Quran, there are a lot of stories about past generations. I've already mentioned a few. Every single story in the Quran that's mentioned is inherently miraculous. And the reason why is something that we've learned before. We've learned before that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was illiterate. There's no way that he could have known about any of these things. So the fact that they're even in the Qur'an in the first place is a sign that this book is from Allah, that this book is from God. And that within itself is a miracle. Now, I am going to share a quick example of this. And the example that I'm going to use is a story from the time of Moses, peace be upon him. At the time of Moses, peace be upon him, um, there was Pharaoh, and Pharaoh had a minister called Haman. And Haman was instructed to build a tall tower. That's all you need to know about this story. That's the basic fact of the story. Now, the thing about this story and the thing about the man Haman is that he's also mentioned in the Bible, but in a completely different context. So when the Quran said actually he was a minister of Pharaoh and he was asked to do this, People said, oh, the Quran is wrong. People start saying, oh, that's a mistake, etc., etc. But actually, when we look at the research today and we look at what historians today, so not 1400 years ago, today, know, they've looked at the hieroglyphics, which are basically little pictures you see in pyramids, um, and they've interpreted that back into words. So this is a dead language. This language has been dead for 2000 years. And they've interpreted it. And lo and behold, there's records that at the time, roughly when we think Moses, peace be upon him, was alive, there was a man called Haman, and his job was construction. Now, why am I sharing this with you? And why have I got a picture of a pyramid, <laughs> apart from the fact that pyramids are relevant to this story? It's because the base, all the stories in Quran are miraculous, just by the fact that they're in there, because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, couldn't have known about them. But the reason we have a pyramid is because 
as we learn more, as human beings go forward and we learn more, we can actually say with more certainty about every single point in these stories that actually, yes, they're true. That actually after 1400 years, now that we're researching into it more, we can prove all of these things. We can prove the little facts in Quran. And honestly, that is the beauty of the Quran, that as we learn as human beings, the miracle increases. First, it was just a miracle because it was in the Quran. And then it's a miracle because actually we learn that all of these little things add up. And honestly, we will come back to this again and again, that the Quran isn't a static book. It just becomes the more you study, the more you look into it, the more you research, the more uh, like amazingness you find within it. Um, we'll move on to literary miracles, inshallah. What do we mean by literary miracles? Now, to understand this, I'm just going to explain a basic fact. Um, and I want everyone to remember this. Inshallah, I'll come back to it. Well, actually, I'm going to come back to it. So if you don't remember it now, don't worry. I will I'll remind you again later. But the nature of Qur'an is, as we mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Angel Gabriel, who then revealed it to the Prophet, peace be upon him. The key here is that it wasn't revealed in one massive go. It was revealed in parts over 23 years, and then it was compiled together into a book. Now, the reason why this is amazing, absolutely amazing, is because I want you to think of any great motivational speaker, any speaker. Um, okay, let's take Barack Obama, for, for example. Regardless of his political views, he's a very well-spoken man. He's really well-spoken. I want you to take bits and pieces of what he said over many, many years and then put them together as a book without adding anything to it. And it would just be utter nonsense, wouldn't it? It wouldn't make any sense. There'd be no flow to it. It would, it really, it would be completely incoherent. But the beauty and the miracle of Quran is that we have all of these chunks of verses revealed over 23 years and they come endlessly. And the reason why they come together Quran is not the words of a human being. And the Quran is not even the words of the Prophet of God. The Qur'an is the word of Allah. And that's why it's able to do this. And it's like we mentioned, the, like we mentioned before, the more you look into it, the greater and the more beautiful the miracle becomes. Because I, I want to take this one very small verse. وَرَبَّكَ فكبر. Okay? Um, I know, mashallah, many of you are slowly learning Arabic, and that's excellent. And we're just going to focus in on this simple verse, and it means magnify your Lord. What I want you to look into is the letters. You've got ra, ba, ka, fa, ka, ba, ra. So to make it easier, r, b, k, f, k, b, r. What do you notice? If you go forwards, the letters are the same. If you go backwards, the letters are the same. It's the same order, regardless which way you look at it. R, B, K, F, K, B, R. It's the same, right? Try to recreate that. Try to make a sentence in English that's exactly the same if you say it forwards and backwards, has a powerful meaning, and then I want you to do that without writing it down. I want you to just say a sentence. It's impossible. You can't do it. And this is another example of the beauty of the Qur'an. That there are many verses in the Qur'an like this that follow the same theme. And it's impossible to do this as a human being just out of the blue able to say those verses and to make it do that. So the beginning is the same. If you read it backwards and forwards, it's the same and it has a beautiful meaning. But again, the impossible is possible with Allah. We're able to do that. The Qur'an is able to do that because it is revelation from Allah. And there are so many examples of this. And it's just the lit there are so many examples of these types of miracles, these literary miracles. And they're just impossible to recreate. And that's how we know it's from Allah. I want to briefly mention scientific miracles. I really like scientific miracles. There's loads of them in the Qur'an. There are many, many books written about this. 
There is a few verses in the Quran that talk about the human being and how a person is made, essentially. Um, if you have a quick look at the screen, I will basically paraphrase. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that man's made from an extract of clay. We placed him as a drop of sperm in a safe depository, i.e. the womb, and that sperm formed a clot, the lump, and from that lump, you've got bones, and it gets the shape of a human being. And Allah puts a soul in it, and that's how we are created. And this is amazing. It might not be amazing for us because I imagine, <laughs> I'm hoping everyone knows this already from all the things we get taught at school and things nowadays. But the fact that 1400 years ago, they, that this was in the Quran is a miracle point blank. That this idea that the sperm makes the egg and then that grows, you know, that clings to the womb of the mother and then it grows into a child. That is miraculous because let me put it into context for you. 1400 years ago, people were arguing whether women had souls. This is what was happening actually in Europe amongst the non-Muslims. So you can see like the mindset of that era. People were very thinking, and yet this is in the Quran. And the more we learn about science, the more we learn that this is true. And that is the beauty of basically every miracle in the Quran. The more we learn as human beings and the more we go forward, it's like miracles just popping out left, right and center. It's honestly, it's beautiful. And we've touched on scientific miracles, literary miracles, historical miracles. We could touch about physics, biology, philosophy, history. We could touch about everything. It's all in the Quran in different amounts. But this is the key point. When you open up the Quran, it is not a textbook. You're not going to find a chapter on biology or a chapter on physics or a chapter on ethics. It doesn't work like that. And in fact, it doesn't go into full details about one thing either. It doesn't tell you everything you need to know about biology. It just doesn't. That's not how the Quran works. The beauty is the Quran talks about everything in just enough detail necessary to address the theme. Okay, so f focus in on that sentence. The Quran will touch upon many topics, but just enough to address the theme. So you're probably thinking that answer doesn't count, the tool. How can you say how can you say that? You can't tell us that it addresses it enough to explain the theme. What is the theme? How much is necessary? What is the Quran actually trying to get at? What is it focused on? And ultimately, ultimately, the Quran is inviting us to the right way. That is the purpose. That is the aim of the Quran. Everything that's mentioned in the Quran, even if it seems like it's lots of topics and it's jumping from this to that, it's not. Because the underlying theme is always the same. I hope that makes sense. The underlying theme is to invite people to do the right way, invite them to peace, invite them to paradise, lead them to God. So it may jump from topic to topic, but this is always consistent. Now, in order to do that, it has to explain what life is all about. In order to guide people, it has to explain what life is all about. And the reason behind this is because as human beings, it's just our nature. If someone tells us, you've got to do things like this, our initial response is why you got to explain it we don't function like that as people we want con context we're inquisitive so Allah provides this context in the Quran you know he explains to us what free will is he explains how Ad Adam and Eve he, you know he explains how the first human beings were given guidance how humanity strayed into sin in various ways. He explains what is sin, what is goodness, how the prophets were sent to remind us about God. If you noticed in basically every single session we've done on fundamentals, in this course alone, I think in every single session we probably mentioned something from the Quran because the Quran gives us that context. It teaches us the reality of life is that we're here for a short period of time as a test. And then Allah will judge us, and then we either go to hellfire or paradise. And so when we really think about what the Quran is, it is about us, it is about you. It is about everything we need to know as human beings 
to live moral and beneficial lives, to live good lives, to be good pre- people. It's about our problems. It's about our journey. You know, it's about us. It's about our roots. Where did we come from? Where did human beings come from? And our future, where are we going? It's about divine guidance. And the question now is, why is guidance so important? And this is a bit of a tangent, but I think it's so important to understand this. Because many people, they think that religion is only for a certain type of people. And many people get a bit confused about this word guidance because we don't really use it often in day-to-day life. So it's, it's important that we kind of deconstruct it and understand what it really means. Guidance is basically 100% necessary for us to function as human beings. You know, if uh, if any of you have children or if any of you have ever watched a documentary about how you should uh, raise your children, those parenting documentaries and things on TV, you will know that children, they need guidance, they need boundaries, they need positive praise. It's all part of their development. And even as adults, regardless of religious belief, We crave meaning and we crave purpose and you can't get away from it. And the truth is the kind of world we live in at the moment, we generally, it's a lot easier to get our basic needs. I know some people are still struggling, may Allah make it easy for them. But for most of us living in this country, we can open our fridge and there's probably going to be food in it. And we have a roof over our heads. We have most of our basic needs, right? And because of that, we are so much more aware of our well-being, like our overall well-being and our spiritual needs and the needs of our spirit. And the reason why I can say this with such confidence is because of a phenomena that we see nowadays. I think phenomena is the best word. And it's called a midlife crisis or a quarter life crisis. This is the result of not giving yourself meaning or purpose. We need it. Without it, we malfunction as human beings. And so when we talk about Quran, not only is it a miracle, it is an absolute blessing, like a true blessing from Allah, because we need it for our happy existence. To be alive and to be happy and to be functioning as a human being, you need to feel like you have a purpose. And we do. We do have a purpose. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God tells us what it is in the Quran. So we've covered a little bit of um, the kind of, I want everyone to get a feel of what the Quran is and what we're about to delve into in a lot more detail, inshallah. Let's talk about the Quran and the wisdom of how it was revealed. Okay, this is something I've just touched upon before, but we'll talk about it a little bit more slowly and a little bit more detail. So I mentioned the Qur'an was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, via the angel Gabriel, from Allah, from God, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it came chunk by chunk, a few verses at a time. Why? Why was it revealed in small sections and not all at once? The simplest way to understand this is, do you remember how I spoke about the Qur'an's aim? We spoke about that the aim of the Qur'an was to guide people, right? The Prophet, peace be upon his aim, was exactly the same. It overlaps. They're both means of guiding people back to Allah, to invite people to worship God. And the reason why the Qur'an was revealed in chunks is because it was revealed based on what the Prophet needed in order to fulfill that mission, okay? The Prophet needed to guide people back to God and back to their roots. And in order to do that, Allah, God revealed particular verses to support him in that. And that's why it's revealed chunk by chunk, few verses at a time. And those verses are relevant to whatever the Prophet, peace be upon him, was going through whilst he was trying to achieve that mission of guiding humanity back to God. Let's Let's use some examples because sometimes that helps in understanding these things. Um, We spoke about the Prophet's life in Mecca and Medina in previous sessions. But generally speaking, I hope everyone remembers, but we will recap. In Mecca, the Prophet, peace be upon his life, is very difficult. 
people were very horrible to him, essentially. And no one was Muslim at that point apart from the Prophet and his wife, right? And he was guiding, he was guiding people and then slowly, slowly more Muslims came about. And because of that, we see that the verses that were revealed in Mecca reflect that. They were very short and concise and they focused on this idea of who is Allah? Who is Allah? What is our relationship with Allah? Again and again and again. Because the people weren't Muslim at that time. Does that make sense? The verses relate to the situation he was in. And then when they were a bit more Muslims, but they were facing so much hardship in Mecca, the verses again that were revealed reflected that. They were all about encouraging the Muslims, teaching the Muslims how to build brotherhood. And then when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, moved to Medina, and there were Jews, and there were Christians, and there were hypocrites, there were different types of people there, the verses again that were revealed reflected that. They were about how to deal with these different types of people. And as you probably remember, that we did a session about all the battles and things like that that happened. And again, the verses reflected that. They talked about war ethics. They talked about how to behave in victory and defeat and what you can learn from it. Now, it's important to note that because of the very nature of how the verses were revealed, that they were revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, at certain times in his life when he needed them to support his mission of guiding people to God. Because of that, naturally, many of the verses speak about the Arab people. They speak about the Quraysh, you know, the clans and the tribes, the Arab people. Many of the verses do that. The way to understand this is that these were practical examples for us. These verses are also relevant to us because the lessons you learn from these stories, from the things that Allah, from the things that God told the Arabs, we can also learn lessons from that. So although it mentions the Arabs specifically, the lessons are for the entirety of humanity. And you know what, I'm gonna use the M word again. This is a miracle as well. Do you know why this is a miracle? It's a miracle because Allah, God, is addressing the Arabs and yet this book is for the whole of humanity. And the reason why that's a miracle is I want you to think about how do you speak to a child? How do you speak to your teacher or your colleague or your family member or your friend? It's very different. The language you use is very different. You might well be talking about the same topic but the language you use is very, very different in order to cater for that person, right? But now we have a book that is able to cater for everyone. You know, if you are a professor at a university, you can read this book. If you dropped out of high school, you can read this book. You know, it, it doesn't matter where you're at in life. You can read this book and benefit from it. And this is the beauty of Quran that is able to address everyone all at once in this powerful manner and instill in people's heart love, bravery, compassion, self, the ability to self-sacrifice and use your efforts towards good. It's able to instill all of these qualities in people all at once using the same verses. It's amazing. It really, really is amazing. And so I've spoken about, you know, how these verses were, were revealed chunk by chunk. How did we go from all of those verses revealed in pieces over many years to a physical book that we have on our bookshelves? How did we do that? The most important thing, and the thing we're going to focus in for the next couple of minutes, is that these verses came little by little, depending on the prophet was going through, right? Now, there has to be an order. You know, to make it into a book, you have to put it in a particular order. Now, this order was determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know this because Allah revealed the book to angel Gabriel who then revealed it to the Prophet, peace be upon him, right? The angel Gabriel actually went through the Qur'an from beginning to end, front cover to back cover in a way, during his lifetime, many times. 
And the Prophet, peace be upon him, he taught the companions to memorize the verses in that order. And then he would recite the Quran in prayer in that order. So we know that during the Prophet, peace be upon him's time, there was a definite order to which order all of these verses should be recited and read. Okay? And even the Quran refers to itself as a book. So although it had verses from here, there, and everywhere coming together, it was always meant to be a book. It was always meant to be read in a specific order. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God is the one who determined that order. Having said that, the actual process of writing it down physically, that happened after the Prophet, peace be upon him, passed away. I'm hoping that makes sense. That Allah determined the order, the Prophet, peace be upon him, taught the people that order, that was the order everyone memorized it in. But then actually physically writing it down as a book, that happened after he passed away. And the reason why that happened after he passed away is because there was a battle in which many companions passed away as well. The many people who had memorized the Quran passed away. And the long and short of it is the companions of the Prophet said, you know what, to preserve this book, we need to write it down because so many of those who have memorized it have passed away. We need to write it down here and now. And there was a little bit of disagreement, but then they decided to do it. And the Sahaba, the companion who was instructed to do it, was Zayd ibn Thabit. May Allah be pleased with him. And he was the most suitable for doing this because he actually learned the Quran from the Prophet, peace be upon him. And he was there when the Prophet, peace be upon him, recited the Quran from beginning to end to the angel Gabriel. Okay. And in order to write this down into the book, in order to compile all these verses into a book, into the Quran, first, Zayd ibn Thabit had to confirm that, yes, that's definitely a verse of the Quran and it's definitely in that order. There were also pieces that lots of people had written down. You know, they would hear some verses from the Prophet and they may, may have written it down. It wasn't a full book, but they'd written down those pieces. They looked at those pieces of writing and then all of the companions who had memorized it at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. When all of these three sources agreed, then it was written down. And that sort of finalized version of the book was kept in the house of Hafsa, the daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And this is a really important piece of reflection that we need to do because you're probably thinking, why is the order that the book, the Quran was made in at the end, different to the order it was revealed in? Like, why, why isn't it just in chronological order? And to understand that, we have to understand why it was revealed in the first place. We, the reason why it was revealed in the first place was to support the Prophet, peace be upon him, in his journey. Now, at the beginning, there weren't ma very many Muslims, so all the verses were to do with what is Islam, like the basics of Islam. And then at the end of the Prophet, peace be upon him's life, there were loads of Muslims. You had a huge you know, community of Muslims, so all of it was to do with the laws and how to live together, right? So really, it makes sense that when you're going to compile it into a book, the first chapters that you read have to be relevant. The Quran was always meant to be relevant and to be lived. It wasn't meant to just be read like that willy-nilly. It was to be lived. So the first verses and chapters in the Quran had to be what was relevant to the Muslims at that time. And at that time, they were a huge community. So you'd notice when you start reading the Quran, the first you know, chapters, the first chunk of the Qur'an is mostly to do with how to live together in a community and what the laws are, because that was the most relevant thing. And that's the wisdom behind why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why God said that it should be compiled in that order. And that's what we've just gone through now. That's why the relevant aspects came first. 
And in doing so, we also notice that, and what you will notice when you start studying the Qur'an, is that there's chapters from Mecca and Medina, and they're all interspersed together. And the reason behind that is to give you a holistic view. You know how we said the verses in Medina were a bit different to the verses in Mecca? So when you read it, in order to get that kind of well-rounded view of Islam, that's why it's that way. So one, the wisdom of its order is to do with its purpose, is to do with putting the most relevant bits first. And the second is to make it holistic. So you get that full picture. And this, this is another miracle, the miracle of the preservation of that order. That Quran, the Quran that we are that we are reading, is exactly the same as the one that was revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Now, having said that, I want everyone to look at the screen right now. I've put a sort of a ye old version of a script of the Quran and something sort of more what what we are more familiar with on the screen. Spot the difference. I want everyone to use their minds. <laughs> Can you see the difference? There are a lot more dots and a lot more dashes on the one at the bottom. That isn't because the Quran has been changed. You have to bear in mind, when the Quran was revealed, it was revealed to Arabs. Arabs can read Arabic. When the Quran spread to other countries, to non-Arabs, they cannot read Arabic so well. So these dots and these dashes that you see, they don't change the meaning. They're literally just there to make it easier to recite for non-Arabs. It's just to explain how to say the letters doesn't change the meaning at all. And actually, around this time as well, a few things happened with the Qur'an. One was that when it was spreading, it was going to Arab nations that had different dialects, which was fine at first. But then the companions decided, actually, we should standardize it and just have one dialect. It'll make it easier for everyone. It will solve any confusion. The different dialects didn't change the meaning, but they thought, let's standardize it to make it easier, stop any confusion. So they standardized it to one dialect. They added the dots to make it easier to read for non-Arabs. And then what they would do is they would send the Qur'an to all these different nations, and then they would send a qari, so someone who's versed in reading the Qur'an, so that people could hear what it sounds like when it's recited. And it's this, you know, attention to detail, this beautiful attention to detail that means that every, everyone reading the Qur'an, what you're reading can be traced back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that actually even any variance, now what I mean by variance is that some of the words in Arabic can be recited two different ways, but that doesn't change the meaning, it adds to the meaning. Uh, let's, uh, let's do a hypothetical example. There might be a word in Arabic that read one way, it means love, but read the other way, it means loyalty. As you can see, those are two kind of versions of the same word. It just adds to the meaning. OK. We have been speaking about this from a very sort of miraculous spiritual point of view. And I mentioned before, I like it when everyone uses their brain. We spotted the difference before and we thought about it. And I want us to think about it logically again. I want us to think about the Qur'an from a logical point of view as well. There are three options when it comes to Qur'an. One is that it's a proper re revelation. It's a true revelation from God. The second is maybe a human being wrote it. They just wrote it down and they didn't really mean for everyone to think it was a revelation. And the third option is it was written by a human being and they were trying to pretend it was from God. OK, these are your three options. If you look at the Quran objectively, these are your three options for what the Quran could be. We can cross off number two straight away because the prophet, peace be upon him, always said that it's a revelation from God. So there was no mistakes there. Then you have two options left. It's either true or it's made up. It's written by a human being, pretending that it's revelation. The reason why it's not number three, the reason why it is not number three, comes in the Quran itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in many verses in the Quran, speaks about how these are not words of a poet. 
or a soothsayer or anyone like that. And that these are not even words of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And that if he had this very firm verse in one of the chapters of the Quran that says that, you know, if he, if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had fabricated it or added anything to it, we would have seized him by his right hand and we would have cut him from the aorta. And there is none of you who could prevent us from that. What does that mean? That sounds very extreme. But it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to prove a point to the non-Muslims at the time who were saying this. That actually if the Prophet, peace be upon him, lied about anything in this book and tried to attribute it to God when it's not from God, there would be a firm punishment for him. And secondly, we know that it is not written just by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because there were many times, there were times when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he wanted revelation, but the revelation didn't come. Because the revelation only comes based on Allah's timing. And based on that, we know that leaves us with this, that this is a true revelation from God. That's how we can logically derive it. And I mentioned timing. I mentioned that the verses came at the specific time that Allah wanted to reveal them. This is so, so important because why was the Quran revealed at specific times? We mentioned this briefly before, why it was revealed in parts so that it can be implemented. The Quran was revealed at specific times to build a social movement, inviting people to Islam, building up their character. So when we talk about Quran, we can't get away from this. When we read and sit and study this book, it's more than just being a good person sat at home reading your Quran every day. It's more than that. The purpose of this revelation was to create a social movement to make the world a better place. And that purpose that it was revealed for 1400 years ago is the same purpose. It has the same purpose today. And so when it was revealed in the Prophet, peace be upon him's lifetime, and it was re relevant to everything the Prophet, peace be upon him, was going through, in the same way, when you read it today, you will realize that is relevant to everything that you are going through when you walk this path, when you walk the same path of the Prophet, peace be upon him, to get to God, you will realize that it is relevant to you. And you'll realize that the people and the challenges you read about in the Quran, you're going to face them. You will, inevitably, you will face them. And the guidance, and this is the beauty of it, again, it all comes full circle. The guidance for dealing with that is in the Quran. The very first chapter of the Qur'an that I know many of you are probably memorizing, some of you may already have memorized, is the one we read in prayer all the time, Surah Fatiha. That is a prayer for guidance. And the whole of the Qur'an is an answer to that prayer. The whole of the Qur'an is an answer to that. And becoming Muslim and being Muslim is the most challenging thing you will ever do. It will test you at every step. And if you want the answers to that test, then it is right here. And do you know what? It was even challenging for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when it was revealed to him. How was it revealed to him? How the first verse revealed to him? He was in the mountain of Hira and the angel Gabriel came and he came and gave the revelation. And he said to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, read. And the Prophet said, I don't know how to read because obviously he was illiterate. And the angel Gabriel squeezed him and he said, read. And the Prophet said, I do not know how to read. And then the angel Gabriel squeezed him again and said, read. And the prophet, peace be upon him, said, what shall I read? And that is how the first verses came to us. Ikra, read, read in thy name, in the name of thy Lord who created. That is how the first verses came to us. Islam, is a is, Islam will make your life so much more simpler, but there are challenges as well. And the answer to those challenges are in this book. And so it went from there. That was how the first verses were, were revealed. And it took us all the way to the Prophet's last sermon, which we learnt about in another session, where the Prophet said, I have left you my Quran and Sunnah, my way of life. The Quran is the complete code for life, but it doesn't go into nitty gritty details. It's a blueprint. And the way we understand that blueprint is by looking at the Prophet's life. And I want you to reflect on this. 
that the the Quran started with Iqra, read, and it ends it ends in a way with the Prophet's last sermon where he says to live the Quran. It starts with you reading it and it will end with you living it the way the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lived it. And it is a living book. And by that, I mean we have to put it into practice. This book encourages us to think and to use our minds. And there are different interpretations of these verses, like we mentioned before. And so long as they follow the principles of Islam, you know, so long as they follow those basic principles and they don't create division and they create unity, then that's excellent. The Quran is a living book. It wants you to use your mind and think about the word choice. It wants you to ask questions. And really, that's the beauty of it. It allows us to grow. You know, it's not a static thing. It's, it's constantly, we're learning more about the miracles that are within it. And this aspect of understanding the different interpretations, this is for scholars of the religion. It's not really for me and you. Inshallah, we all become scholars of the religion. I mean, but this is for scholars of the religion. But I thought I would mention it because it's all part of the beauty of Quran. This growth, this living book that you implement, that you understand that the, the more you learn about the world, the more you learn about the Quran it is, is like unlike anything you have ever read before. And I want to, the big conclusion, and it is a big conclusion because I want to bring everything together. This session, all the sessions, let's, let's understand this because actually this topic helps us understand everything that we've learned before. Number one, logical derivation. Okay, what do I mean by this? Everything can be logically derived. The fact that Allah is our creator, the fact that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is actually a messenger, and the fact that the Quran is true revelation from God, all of it can be logically derived, and we've done it in previous sessions. And why is this important? Because that means if you believe in one of them, you automatically believe in the others. If, I, if what I'm speaking to you today speaks to your heart and you understand that the Quran has to be revelation from God, then when you read the book, you'll realize that God must exist. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last prophet. And if you believe in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then you will automatically believe in Allah and the Qur'an. And why is it so important that we understand it logically as well? This is important because Islam is not a feeling, it is a fact. And I want you to remember this. You will have times in your life when you are incredibly sad and incredibly challenged. We know there will be challenges. Uh, you know, all of the sessions we've spoken about, we've spoken about what happened to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in his own life, the messenger of God. We will also face challenges. And I want you to remember, no matter how you feel, Islam is a fact, not an emotion. You can't turn away from something when you're sad. That's not how it works. You know, um, when I was at college, you, I was learning this complex algebra, and I tell you what, that made me sad. But I can't, I couldn't turn away from it and say that it's not true. You know, the truth is always the truth. So it's important you understand things logically as well. The Quran and the Sunnah. The Sunnah is the way of the Prophet. It's an Arabic word that essentially means the way the Prophet did things. The Quran is your guide for navigating life, alongside with the way the Prophet did. The Qur'an, it was sent to people to invite people towards Islam and to create a Muslim community. That was the purpose of the Qur'an, is guidance, right? It was its guidance to make you a better person. But more than that, it was when it was revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, it was meant to make people better people, but it was meant to create a good community. So for you as well, as you learn the Qur'an, it will make you a better person. But it will also help you make a better community. It will help you make a better world. You know, the Quran was never meant to be something you just read in your houses quietly. It's something that you live. Islam is something that you live. It was meant to be shared and it was meant to be lived. Unity. Number three, unity. From the moment we started this course to this end session, I hope you've all noticed how we speak about these verses and how we speak about how Allah, 
how God addre addressed the believers, how the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he addressed the believers, the believers, the believers, over and over again, this term, the believers. It doesn't say you, it says the believers, because we are doing this together. We are in this together. We are one community. We are one family. And that's why we keep using the term the believers. And we may not have mentioned it directly in previous sessions, but it's implied all the time. And sometimes it's important to say it quite frankly. We are in this together. We've learned about how the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he built that community. He learned about his life. And in fact, right now, I told you that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, built a community and he changed the world. And I've told you that you're going to do it too. And that is an absolutely huge task. And if you're sat here thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to change the world? Let me tell you, the way you will achieve it is when you work together. That's the only way you can achieve it. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, didn't go on a one-man mission to change the world. He focused on people and he looked after people. He helped people to understand what their purpose in life is and step by step that built a better world. So ultimately, we need to stick together. I hope, you know, through doing this course and working together and through actually doing this session about the Quran and seeing how it affects our day to day lives and how we're all linked to this one book, we all have this central point that we understand this, that we understand the verse of the Qur'an that told us to hold firm to the rope of Allah all together. We are all part of this family. Whatever stage you are in your journey, you're a part of this family. So don't put, belittle yourself, don't push yourself to one side. You're a part of this family and we are really, truly each other's sisters. And we've said that throughout. And the Qur'an reaffirms this for us. It's part of the beauty of the Qur'an. And number four, Tawheed and the service of humanity. If you forget everything else, which I hope you don't, but if you do, I want you to remember this. It relates to this session and relates to all the sessions that we have done. Because this concept, this is the fundamental that is in the Quran over and over again, that Tawheed, which means oneness, we did a whole session on it. Oneness, understanding that Allah is one, that God is one. This is the key to saving yourself from hellfire. This is the key to entering par paradise. This is understanding that God created you, that you are going to worship no one else apart from God. You are not going to put yourself down, that you're going to have that strong self-esteem and that your purpose in life is not money, is not even happiness. It's all about seeking the pleasure of God. And it will simplify everything in your life. It will give your every limb, your every waking moment will have meaning because we learned about that today, didn't we? Like we need meaning. It will give you meaning and it will teach you to use your skills and your talents and everything you have in the pursuit of God and in the service of humanity. And I know these conclusions seem huge, but the Quran is a miracle. So I had to put these conclusions in. Because when we talk about miracles, when we talk about the fact that we have a miracle with us today, it should inspire us. But I want you to remember one thing. Islam actions are rewarded by intentions. And I know, sisters, that you're all trying very hard and you're putting in your effort to become better Muslims. And Allah will reward you accordingly. And I also want you to remember to take baby steps. Do as much as you can. This is so key. Because did you see the way the Qur'an was revealed? Chunk by chunk, small amounts. You know, it went over the same topic again and again and again for nine years at a time until people understood it and were able to implement it. So you, do, you need to do the same. We all need to do the same. That we have to do as much as we can. You learn as much as you can manage and you implement it. And as you do that slowly, slowly, you will be able to create betterment in yourself and create a better community things don't happen overnight but the reason we talk about these big things and we have these big aims is because of Islam because we can see the final goal is paradise because we understand what the final goal is you know if you're running a marathon you you still have to think about the finish line and that's why we're talking about this I want you to think about the finish line 
but I want you to run the marathon slow and steady. Uh, I hope that makes sense. I want you to think that the main goal is to become a better person and to build a better world. But I want you to run that marathon slow and steady because actually don't sell yourself short. You can do it because out of all the billions of people on earth, Allah chose you to have Islam and you are special. And this is what the Quran teaches us. The Quran teaches us all of this and the Quran will teach you how to do this. And I want to end on something that we covered in another session. And it's the Prophet, peace be upon him's last sermon. And I want you to really think about this because I think it's so apt in summarizing everything that we've done over the past few weeks. I will read it verbatim out to you. I just want you to reflect. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said in his, you know, one of his most grand addresses to us. Not to the companions, it was to the companions, but we still have it with us today, so it is to us. Imagine he is speaking to you. Remember. One day you will appear before Allah and answer your deeds. So beware, do not stray from the path of righteousness after I am gone. O oh people, no prophet or apostle will come after me and no new faith will be born. Reason well, therefore, O oh people, and understand words which I convey to you. I leave behind me two things, the Quran, and my example, the sunnah. And if you follow these, you will never go astray. And all those who listen to me shall pass on my words to others and those to others again. And may the last ones, and may the last ones, my words better than those who listen to me directly. Be my witness, O Allah, that I have conveyed your message to your people. And this, my sisters, this is the fundamental of Islam. To understand who Allah is, to understand who God is, and to use every effort that you have to please Allah and to pass it on, to pass on that religion to others. And really, I pray that Allah makes us people of Quran. And he gives us the ability to internalize what we have learned in our own selves, but then to also be able to spread that message the way the Quran was re you know, revealed, to internalize it in our own selves slowly but surely, and then to share it with our families, with our communities, to the world. And I hope Allah, I pray that Allah helps us to build you know, a kinder, softer, more beautiful world. I mean, Okay, I think we shall end it there. I've just put up on the screen some of our social media because, like I said, it's important that we all stay connected. There are big things that we need to do and we can only do them when we work together, inshallah. I will pass you back to Amal, I believe. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Batul, for that. Honestly, it was such an enlightening, uh, enlightening presentation that you gave. Um, Jazakallah khair for really that really great conclusion to the series. Um, so now what we're going to do is we'd like to have some feedback from everyone. This has been quite a long course, so we want to uh, always continue improving and see what we can do that will uh, better the sessions. So if anyone would like to give some feedback, whether that be you can turn your mics on or in the chat room or the chat box, um, uh, please uh, let us know if so, if there's anyone that would like to say anything. Assalamualaikum. Can I speak? Yes, uh, of this course. Is um, Linda, my is name is Lindsay. I'm. I live in New York, <clears throat> and uh, I converted six years ago, and uh, it's been my uh, fully gradual journey in Islam. I'm studying and learning uh, every day something new, and thank you, Doctor Batu. 
uh, interesting lecture. It was actually the best from all uh, lectures which I uh, listened on this course. Um, thank you very much. It, it was very interesting. I might listen it again, definitely. And uh, the feedback I want to give as a newly converted sister, and you mentioned it in your um, uh, course that is for newly converted sisters, I would like to see more like uh, practical things. What can we do in our life? How can we, how can modern ladies adjust to the uh, non-Islamic, uh, non-Islamic community, to the world of Islam? You know, um, I would like to know more about how do we say, how do we what do we say? Um, how do we prepare ourselves? Because maybe some newly converted sisters are very recently converted to Islam, so they don't know exactly how to pray. As most is available, so we can't go and see how other sisters pray and how they sit, how they bowling, how they go into stage that. So I would like to see more of this, actually, and I was expecting to see, so I could correct my mistakes if I'm making any, because I've been teached by my husband, who's a man, and obviously he said, well, see, lady doing different and different. And in York, we have only one more teacher far away from us, so it's not only in the... Uh, yeah, so I would like to see more practical things uh, like this. Uh, yeah, thank you. Jazakallah khair. Uh, that was Lily, right? Yeah, Jazakallah khair. Um, yeah, you're completely right. I think that's a really, really great idea. Something a bit more practical. Um, yeah, that's a, we'll note that down, inshallah, and we'll, inshallah, prepare some sessions for that. Um, so great feedback. Anyone else would like to contribute or say anything? Um, Aisha says, I really enjoyed the sessions and thank you to all the sisters who organized it. Thank you for coming, Aisha, and listening. Is, I think, someone's mic on? If no one else would like to um, say anything, or maybe there is. That's <laughs> Yeah, this is Nika saying, um, I just wanted to say that I have really enjoyed these sessions. They have been like a, a revision course for me, really. So I, I used to go to this, but because of COVID, I couldn't. But every single session I've enjoyed, particularly the one on Hajj, that's really sort of rang bells with me. Um, it, as I said, it was like a revision course. Every time you hear a speaker, they always have their own perspective on it. And it's always nice because it just builds up your picture all the time just the picture gets bigger and bigger and bigger and I'm grateful for all the support that you have given throughout this course so thank you for such a wonderful course and Jazakallah khair for all of the attendees for coming and listening and all the speakers for presenting um, that's really really great oh um Sana Khan, uh, sorry Suna Khan says Alhamdulillah, I loved every session, and this last session was just simply amazing. MashaAllah, um, has given Sister Batul's sweet voice and depth of knowledge that we understand so easily, and your examples stick with us for so long. Amazing work, my Allah. Bless you, my Allah. Bless all the sisters who organized it. JazakAllah khair. JazakAllah khair. Um, such lovely feedback from everyone. Um, Anything else? Anyone else would like to say say anything? Um, if there is no one else that would like to say anything, um, we're going to um, have a small uh, uh, talk from our sister who is the head of UKIM. Um, and this sister, her name is Dr. Sadia. Um, and she'll be explaining a little bit to you about our organisation and what we do and um, just basically the fundamentals of all, our, our organization where all the sisters who have given talks are either members of or um, you know participate with UKIM. So if I can ask uh, Dr. Sadia to uh, take the floor. 
Jazakallah khairan, Amal. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, Jazakallah khairan. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate all the participants. Alhamdulillah, you have come to the completion of a great course. And I want to extend uh, assalamu alaikum and my best wishes and duas to all of the participants. And then I also want to congratulate and make duas for all the team's effort that were uh, carried out by our uh, sisters here, all the teams, uh, team uh, members. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all the efforts of the sisters who have attended as, uh, uh, as attendees as well as uh, the team members. Of course, for every project, there is a great, uh, uh, you can say, number of hours which go into the planning and execution of a project. But subhanAllah, as Batul has just concluded, it is a beautiful session, as I'm sure all of the sessions the sisters are giving the feedback about. But to conclude uh, the message of Quran, the purpose of our lives, as well as how we have to take this message forward by doing a collective work. And it's our responsibility as Muslim Ummah to do that contribution towards our society and, uh, and uh, all the places we are living in. So um, that's why we thought that it's the best time to give you a brief introduction how our UKIM organization works. Of course, you might be familiar with the name, but those of you who do not know what UKIM stands for, it is a registered charity and we have been working, alhamdulillah, in Britain since 1962. And uh, the department of UKIM Sisters is a part of the full organization of UKIM. And uh, Sisters Wing is also very active like rest of our uh, departments and you can also visit its website. I will give you the URL link in later in the slides. So our vision, as you can see on the slide also, the vision is to build a society which is based on moral and spiritual fundamentals of Quran and Sunnah that Alhamdulillah you have also become familiar now. And you must be um, thinking that how these, uh, you know, uh, once we are comfortable and we know that the peaceful and uh, the moral principles of Islam, how they have to be brought to our uh, community life, to our society. So that's the basic aims and objectives behind our organization, that it is the obligation of all of us. We cannot say if someone has more knowledge or someone has more skills or someone has a special degree in certain subject, only those people can work. It's a duty of all the Muslim Ummah according to the Quran and according to the last sermon of Prophet Of course, some of us have uh, come to this conclusion that, okay, I have understood this purpose of my life and now I want to join hands with the like-minded people who are working towards this cause. And our uh, theme for this session, uh, every time we have our um, uh, planning, we set a theme for our work. So as you can see, the theme is also from Quran, which is the excellence. Because whatever we want to do in our personal life, we also do not settle anything less than excellent, uh, excellence. So why not to do this prophetic mission, this whole collective work towards um, community? It should also be done with excellence, keeping in mind that we want to, first of all, work on our own spiritual uplifting. Of course, if we do not know what are the fundamental principles of Quran and Sunnah, then as a human being, we might be, uh, you know, uh, there might be some principles or some uh, fine lines being crossed. So that's why it's very important that our link as worker of this organization is established with our creator with Quran and with the prophetic mission. So that would be the defining principle. And of course, then we have to look out for opportunities. We have to find the areas of work which are needed. And of course, living in this uh, society, we have to follow and obey the laws of the land. We have to come up with strategies which will be suitable according to this society, this culture, and the needs of and the demands of the community. And then for that matter, we have created certain departments so that the sisters who are working as members, as associate members, or just sympathizers, everyone is welcome on board. 
but then we have to divide our work according to needs of the community. So as you can see, there are so many departments, people can relate to whichever uh, skill set they think they might have. And uh, our social media department, our tarbiya, that is personal development of the workforce, as I mentioned, then our outreach, uh, and uh, alhamdulillah, with the mercy of Allah subhanahu ta'ala, we have sisters in all such departments, We're very active. They are planning, they take uh, the, you know, the plan forward to execution, even in the COVID time. Of course, before COVID, it used to be in the mosques, in the community centers, and even um, homes of our dear sisters, we would, uh, you know, uh, uh, gather and study Quran, and also we would do fundraising and things like that. But due to COVID, most of the things are being run online, but with the help of Allah subhanahu ta'ala, we can't say that for even single day, we could not achieve our targets. If we have the best intention and we have the passion to work for this mission as a volunteer, Allah subhanahu ta'ala grants us help through angels, isn't it? It's mentioned in Quran also. So we have established our relief for the whole of the world, the, all the needy areas, but we are, have also established eye care which is basically targeting the needs of uh, uh, UK. There are people who are in need of funds. They are in, especially in this current crisis, the uh, you know uh, food hubs are really uh, something which we have uh, been successfully running and they are helping the society, alhamdulillah. Uh, we also have set up our children department and of course the department that we are concerned with today, that is the reverse sister department. And this is some of the some of the glimpses or highlights of our work for the past six months. And uh, there are, of course, many more su such pictures, but because of the uh, constraint of time, I will be just showing you some highlights. And uh, of course, you can go to our website and you can see all the live appeals, all the uh, work, Alhamdulillah, which is being done in various parts of, uh, 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 of the world as well in UK, and you can see the details also of those projects there. Now, how our uh, work, uh, the structure of our work is that we have uh, uh, make, made our units, which are called branches or circles, depending on the workforce number. So we have, alhamdulillah, more than 50 plus branches and circles across UK, up even in Scotland, uh, in Edinburgh and Glasgow. And uh, we have a central team which uh, has people or sisters from all various parts of UK. We make a core team for all the departments and then they do the execution, uh, so the planning and what is the need of the time and those kind of advisory uh, uh, work. And then we make plans and then we give them the plans to our zonal teams. And the zones are made for like if we, it is a south zone, so all the cities around London and in the south of England. So they make up a zone. Similarly, we have North zone, we have a Midland zone and a Scotland zone. And then we have sisters there who are also working for the whole zone. And then they pass on the work or the plans to the teams which are in the branches and circle, of course, which are covering one area, one city, like we have a, a, a branch in Bristol, we have a branch in Hayes, we have a branch in uh, uh, Rochdale, so those kind of you know branches. And of course, uh, I want to emphasize here that any sister who agrees with whatever the aims and objectives I have uh, you know um, uh, um, presented to you, and they are in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah principles that how we are serving our Lord and we have to uh, be engaged in community uh, well-being as well as the purification of community. So. And they can join our work. They are the the you know this work is for everyone. There is no um, you can say strict criteria that no one you know someone has to have to fit in such a specific uh, picture, and then only they can join. And our invitation. That's why I'm extending my invitation to to all of you sisters there that you can join hands with you can sisters to inspire and enable the Muslim community to live by Islam and to convey the message of Islam to British society. And our times, our skill set as volunteer of UKIM will be actually only targeting to earn the player of our uh, Lord, inshallah, and also to be witness to humanity so that we can be part of this prophetic mission. And uh, Sister Batul has also showed you our social media websites, but this is uh, also the slide here. 
for our um, uh, you know email address as well as our instagram so once again i want to uh, extend my best wishes and thoughts with all, to all of you and inshallah sister saba is going to tell you our future plan for our revert department jazakallah khairan for giving me time to speak to you uh, assalamu alaikum jazakallah khair um uh, sister sadia for that introduction to ukm i think is really beneficial to understand um the organization that we work with um and yeah we had a few questions before about ukm so it's uh, it's great you cleared that up um so now um i'm going to pass over to sister saba and um she's going to talk to you about some of the new uh, events that we're going to be have uh, coming up and some of the new things that you can attend so I will pass it over to uh, Sister Saba. Um, Assalamu alaikum, Amal. Can you hear me? Wa alaikum assalam. Yes, I can. Jazakum Allah khair. Jazakum Allah khair, Dr. Sadia, for uh, um, uh, explaining the immense work that uh, UKIM and specifically the sister section is doing. I just want to point out that these sisters are just ordinary sisters with their families, with their children, with the school run, with the husbands. A lot of sisters are working from home, of course, with their husbands working in in the same house and they are doing this immense work even in this lockdown and I have um, uh, I, I, I only say alhamdulillah um, that Allah has made us work together and don't sit idle and and wait for the world to to become normal and ordinary uh, like we used to be uh, we are carrying on working. We did not stop for one day. And that made me um, very, um, um, of course, thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, may Allah choose us to carry on working for uh, his religion. Um, um, uh, being uh, a part of the revert section, uh, I was given the responsibility to work in the revert uh, care section. Um, and before the pandemic, uh, we used to have a lot of meetups in Masajid, and that used to be a great fun, uh, meeting new sisters, welcoming sisters to, to, to enter uh, the religion of Islam, teaching them and, and making the sisterhood strong. Pandemic gave us a huge challenge, what we're going to do. So it was the very first time that the revert UKIM uh, sister section revert care compiled um, online course. We didn't want to sit idle and wait for uh, the meetups. Um, so we started uh, thinking and compiling uh, this course. Um, of course, before the pandemic, the courses were happening in different masajid and the sisters would go and um, uh, attend these courses. So different masajid had different style of uh, giving uh, the new Muslims uh, what type of course they want to do, what type of knowledge they want to gain. However, we decided that we will start from the core beliefs. I know when a person becomes Muslim, they have to learn the beliefs of Islam and they accept it and they become Muslim. But we realize that sometimes that process is quite rushed up and people don't realize that there is a huge knowledge waiting for them to explore. So that's why we decided to start from the fundamental and that's we thought is the most beneficial way. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, with Allah's immense mercy, um, the course happened uh, even with different lockdowns. We were worried that children will be home and sisters will be disrupted. But Allah, with his great mercy, made us go through. But no work is, is beneficial or good or I can say perfect without a, a team. And I cannot thank enough to my team who work not only dedicatedly, but with eagerness. All the speakers, they were not 
uh, saying, yes, we'll do it. They were eager to, 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 to do the, their presentation, to compile the, and to do the research first, and then compile the whole thing, and then make the presentation, and then they have an art to explain whatever they need to explain. Um, I have um, so much admiration and um, uh, a thank and appreciation for our speakers. May Allah bless you and may Allah reward you uh, for all that and may Allah keep you with us. Um, and also the technical team, there were sisters who dedicatedly work uh, while the children were home, while the babies were home, they carried on working technicality and technicality have such a huge question marks. You know, one day you're, you're fine and uh, today, I mean, today I'm on my mobile phone because my laptop stopped working this morning. So a technical team has always, they don't know what the day will be, but Alhamdulillah, um, Allah made that easy for them as well. So I I have a big, big jazakumullah uh, khair and thank you for them. And then, then the attendees, oh, how can we present anything if there is no attendees? I was, um, as, a, as a team, the whole team, we weren't sure how this course will be taken from attendees, whether we'll have dropouts, whether we'll have people saying, sorry, we, it's not what we wanted. But, um, but we had, I had messages, I had private messages and in the group, we cannot wait for the next Friday, sister. We enjoyed it so much and we listened to the recordings again as well. These recordings, we can listen with our families as well. I am planning to listen these re this today's recording with my family as soon as Sister Huma will put the recordings on. Um, so um, alhamdulillah for everything. Now what happened? What we're going to do now? Um, we have some ex exciting uh, um, planning and we are, uh, things are in pipeline. Um, the first thing will be if, um, Amal, you can put, yes, the sisters virtual meetup. I know that uh, before pandemic, this would have sound so silly and stupid, but now it's become the norm. Um, we would want to know who you are. All the attendees of this course will be invited around. We, we don't know, we haven't selected the date and the time, but it will be around middle uh, December, inshallah. Uh, we will, of course, let you know in the, uh, um, in the WhatsApp group, and we would request you not to disperse yourself from that WhatsApp, WhatsApp group. Um, another exciting news is that we plan to do weekly uh, study circles like we have done this one. So it will be weekly study circles. Um, the main intention is that we start learning what Quran says. Today we know a little hint of what the book is, but we want to know the message, the divine message, the divine commands, the divine wisdom behind all those commands. And that we can only get from, from Quran, the way of our life. Sister uh, Linda mentioned, uh, sorry, Sister Lily, I think mentioned about how to pray and everything. All the commands are in Quran and inshallah, we will be explaining the, the things as well. Uh, although these sessions will be called Tafsir of Quran, but we will inshallah uh, compile a course on uh, Salah as well. We have already done that in our Halqa, so we will be teaching you that as well. So we request you to keep your eyes open for all the information and announcement, inshallah. For all the attendees who have regularly attended this course, we will be uh, emailing them their certificate as well. Uh, inshallah, we sum up with a short dua. Uh, this is the etiquette of all Muslim gatherings that when we finish the Muslim gathering, we uh, first thank Allah and then we we also uh, ask Allah for his, uh, his uh, uh, carrying on his guidance to us. Allahumma lakal hamdu anta nur samawati wal ard. Wa lakal hamdu anta rabbu samawati wal ard. Anta al haq. وقولك الحق ووعدك الحق وجنة الحق والنار الحق. Oh Allah, all praises are for you. You are the light of the heavens and the earth and whatever is in it. You are the Lord of the heavens and the earth and whatever is in it. You are truth. And indeed, your words are truth. Your promise is truth. Your garden of paradise is truth. 
And of course, your hellfire is truth and may Allah save us from it. Allahumma ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. Allah guide us to the straight path. We need that path to, to, to reach that uh, paradise. Oh Allah, we ask you to keep us close to your book, the Quran. Give us the ability to recite it in a beautiful manner, to understand it, to implement its commands, and to spread its message. Oh Allah, those who have entered your religion in their adulthood, make it easy for them to learn your beautiful religion, to understand it, and to fully benefit from your obeying your commands. Oh Allah, give us protection from the evil of this virus and make this calamity easy on us. Give us uh, full healing, those who are ill and mercy to all those who have departed us. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashatu la ilaha illa ant. Nastakfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wal asr inna l'insana lafi khusr illa ladhina amanu wa amilu s-salihati wa tuwaza bil haqqi wa tuwaza bil sabr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jazakumullah khair amal.